All right, we'll call to order the Committee of the Whole meeting for Tuesday, April 26th. Uh, first item on the agenda tonight is roll call. Miller? Miller? Rosado? Back? Here. Connolly? Here. Chanson? Here. Solfa? Here. Wolf? Here. Baron? Here. Lehman? Here. Ayazi? Here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Here. Sarone? And Vogel Singer? Here. We have 11 out of 14. All right. Thank you. Uh, second reminder for tonight is to uh, speak directly into your microphone for the recording and broadcast tonight. And then anybody that's coming up, you can just use the microphone that's right there at the, the podium. And uh, item number three is items to be removed, added, or changed. Uh, the only thing I know of is we are, do not need um, a personnel section in executive session, so we'll remove uh, B on executive session. And then item number four is matters from the public. Do we have anybody here for matters from the public that are not on the agenda for tonight. Maybe online. Let's see any raised hands. No. Okay, and we will move on to the consent agenda. Alderman Chanzit, you are in the building. You're going to make me read already? Huh? You don't have to. Yeah, we're just all happy you're here. We're making, we're, we're making you work. Thank you. Appreciate it. I Welcome think you back. sent your issue over to me because I can't. With, are, you, are you really? I've got some great drugs at home if you like some. <laughs> <laughs> funny, the only, public meeting. funny thing, the, the only thing that worked was Indica. Surprise. Uh, the uh, consent agenda reads as follows. Uh, approvals, the uh, Cow Executive Session Minutes uh, from February 22nd, uh, 2022, and uh, Cow Executive Session Minutes from March 1st, 2022. Um, and then also Resolution 22-50, authorizing execution of a contract with uh, ERA, uh, Valdivia contractors uh, for the 2022 bridge preventative maintenance project for an amount not to exceed the budget amount of 150,000. Um, I would move that we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. Motion by Chanzit, second by Sol. Oh. Roll call, please. Chanzit? Aye. Solfa? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Baron? Aye. Lehman? Aye. Ayasi? Aye. Malay? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Sarone? Vogel Singer? Aye. Miller? Rosado? Beck? Aye. And Connolly? Aye. Motion carried 11 to 0. All right, thank you. All right, up next is item six, a presentation on progress on the water treatment plant. Welcome. Hello. I switch it. Oops. Oh, here. Is that sharing? And then if you want, Emily, you can also um, select on the pictures of people to make it just you, the presenter. Uh, yeah, just the, the very, uh, the one that looks like one square at the top. There you go. Ah, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Okay, hi, I'm Emily. I've been doing construction observation out at the water treatment plants. This is our update from the past month. So we're a review of the project scope. Uh, this is the existing water treatment plant number two. We're gonna be adding in this brine area addition, relocating that road, and then adding in a concrete driveway out front. There's a picture of what it'll look like on the bottom. And then a question that was brought up at last meeting was 
about the benefits of the new Brine Building Edition. Uh, so to give you a more thorough answer than last time, uh, we put together this little infographic, which everyone should have a hard copy of that's in person. And then I believe there's a PDF that was emailed out as well. Just a kind of high level overview of it. The existing brine area is relatively small. So inside that room, there's the, the big brine tanks. Um, there's two eight ton tanks. And then there's also some sodium hypochlorite tanks in there along with the chlorine generators. You can see in those first two pictures kind of how tight it is in there. Uh, in order to get the brine salt up into those tanks, operators need to climb up a ladder and carry them all up there. It's a pretty uh, time consuming process and it takes multiple operators upwards of a day to load it all. There was also some limitations on the salt storage. So the salts delivered on pallets and those pallets are stored inside water treatment plant number two currently. Uh, it kind of crowds some of the equipment and can limit access to the equipment in there. The existing chlorine pumps also are difficult to maintain. They're mounted outside of the brine room and there isn't a ton of room for operators to access those and there are some other operational limitations. So this new brine expansion, um, the additions in this project uh, is the new chlorine pumps, the new brine pumps, new recessed brine tanks so that the operators can load salt without having to climb up the ladder, uh, some additional storage for salt, an overhead door to assist with salt deliveries and unloading, um, a new bathroom, and then a new office space. So then the back page of the sheet kind of highlights these improvements. So you can see a picture of these tanks. They're now recessed, uh, like I mentioned. There's also gonna be some tables that are gonna kind of push right up against the tanks so that operators can easily load salt into them. Um, there's some additional storage space. So all of that extra space in that room that's not being used for equipment is gonna be space to store those salt pallets. And then you can see the office and bathroom as well in there. And then the new chlorine pumps are gonna be skid mounted and located inside the old brine room. So now it's all kind of in one area. Operators don't have to walk all the way around the wall to access them. And it'll help overall with accessibility for maintenance. Uh, take a look through all the rest of the information on those and then you can let us know of any questions as well. So the construction progress from this last month the water treatment plant two expansion in this new brine building. The new brine system startup is ongoing. So you can see those tanks and the tables in that picture. The office furniture was delivered and put inside the building. The overhead door was installed. Electrical installation is ongoing and the finished trim installation <laughs> is ongoing as well. Well, number 11 rehab, uh, same as last time, it's this wall is back in service and we're just waiting on that transducer to be installed. Well, number 10 rehab, the equipment inspection was completed um, on site for that and then the rehab work is ongoing. The high service pump rehab, uh, the estimated reinstallation and testing is still for May and that rehab is continuing. Dualator number two rehab. The exterior of the tank was sandblasted and coated. The painters completed the sandblasting and coating of the detention tank and filter area. The filter area rehab work is ongoing. So the welding work for the underdrain and the trowel repairs is ongoing and then coating touch up is gonna be completed after that weld work is done. Uh, the aer aerator rehab is in progress. The piping work and the filter media is gonna be installed in the filter area after the cells are fully repaired. And then the new valves, piping, and control panel installation is ongoing. The estimated completion date for dualator number two is early May of 2022. And then some miscellaneous improvements to water treatment plant one. Uh, this new window was installed, and then the roof reshingling was completed. Next steps, ongoing brine building modifications, 
uh, complete the rehab for dualator number two, continue high service pump two and five rehab, continue well number 10 rehab, and then put that new brine system online. This is our anticipated construction schedule. Um, again, the do later number two rehab is expected to be completed within this next month along with high service pump two and five. And then that once that brine system is online, that would close out the majority of the work in that new treatment plant number two. And then any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Thank you for the additional info on the, the Brian edition. I think that yeah, you're welcome. To understand where all that money gets spent at. <laughs> yeah. Why it makes it much easier to functionally use those buildings. I do have a question regarding the um, the brine, the eight foot brine, and um, the employees having to go up a ladder. Is that pretty common for carrying up the fifty pound bags of salt and walking up a ladder? I mean, is that Pretty common and that is extremely uncommon okay. um, so it is definitely something uh, big time safety consideration and a driving force behind this project is to make it safer for the operators to be able to load the salt in those tanks okay so uh, what is what is the recommendation I mean are we going to be moving from a ladder at some point or yeah so the new system has recessed tanks so the tanks are actually in a pit where the, yes, thank you, Emily, uh, where you, they are going to be able at level, at ground level, to be able to put the bags on a table and load them and open them up and load them straight into the tank. So you can see uh, the table set up in front of the tanks in the upper left-hand corner uh, picture there. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's at ground level. Instead of climbing a ladder, uh, they'll, be able to, be, they'll pull the, the salt directly from the pilot, put it on the, the table, the loading table, open it up and dump it right in the tank from there. Okay, so they're not climbing up a ladder right now then? They will not as soon as this brine, new brine system is fully operational, which is okay. expected to be within the next month. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody online have any questions? So I can't see anybody right now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you next month. On to item number seven, uh, which is the bid opening for excess land at the southwest corner of Batavia Avenue and West Wilson Street. Not something we get to do very often, but we get to open a bid during a meeting. Every once in a while, we do. Yep. This is the, because the way we are selling this land, it is one that we have to actually open the bids at a public meeting. Um, so uh, we did advertise for uh, this land at the southwest corner of Batavia Avenue and Wilson Street. Uh, we received one bid, which I have here. And I will open it this time. And the bid is from Batavia Buildings uh, for the 4,300 square foot parcel of land, and the purchase price is $5,000. Um, that is uh, within the uh, uh, terms and parameters of the uh, bid specifications. Uh, we will review this, though, and put it on a formal agenda for approval. And okay. move that forward to actually sell the land. That's it. All right. So that is our formal bid opening during a public meeting for $5,000 for the piece of property. And you think that'll be in the next month or so you'll have that? I hope back to in the next couple weeks. Next yes. couple weeks, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you, Thank you very much, Scott. Done. Okay, then we'll move on to item number eight, which is ordinance um, 2222, annexing 209, 210, 213, 230, 231, 304, 305, 314, and 315 Evergreen Drive and 946 Main Street. And Scott, you can stay right there. Yep. This is a continuing effort of our uh, various annexations that we've been doing uh, over the last several years. Uh, this is the 10 properties that are at the corner of Evergreen Drive and Main Street. Um, we uh, solicited for voluntary annexations for these parcels. Uh, we only received, I believe, three uh, petitions, which is less than the majority. So. Because of that, we went ahead and did the involuntary procedure to annex that. We did a notice in the newspaper, so today is the 
formal public meeting for this. Um, if this is approved by the committee, uh, it would be on the uh, May 2nd City Council meeting. But because of the election, we cannot actually annex properties that are occupied by registered voters within 60 days of an election. Our election is coming up in June. So the uh, annexation, while we would pass it, it would not become effective until June 29th. And that's true even if we don't have anybody in that area that would be up for election. If there's, yes, if there's, right. if there's registered voters mm -hmm. in an area, if it was a vacant piece of land, mm -hmm. we don't have to do that. But because there are registered voters in this mm -hmm. area, we would have to wait until after the primary election is complete. Okay. Does anybody have any comments? Anybody online? Do we have anybody else? Anybody in the audience that wants to make a comment on this? And this is part of our ever ongoing little spots and donut holes and whatever you want to call them that are not part of the city. Someday I'll finally be surrounded by city lots and not the, let's see, my backyard and one lot over <laughs> from me done. to the west. We're almost there. We're almost done on the west so, side and we're moving, yeah. starting to move towards the east side. To the end of Walnut Street and then I'll be surrounded by mm -hmm. the city. Okay. Um, if there are no other comments, I will make the motion that we approve Ordinance 22-22, um, annexing 209, 210, 213, 230, 231, 304, 305, 314, and 315 Evergreen Drive, and 946 Main Street. Second. Motion by Wolf, second by Malay. Roll call, please. Wolf? Aye. Baron? Aye. Lehman? Aye. Ayazi? Aye. Malay? Aye. Muir? Aye. Tyrone? Vogelsinger? Aye. Miller? Rosado? <clears throat> Beck? Aye. Connolly? Aye. Tanzan? Aye. And Sulpa? Aye. Motion carried 11 to 0. All right, thank you. And that will need to go on the regular agenda? Regular. It's an involuntary one. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Up next is item number 9, the marquee event for tonight. Uh, downtown plan, proposal, presentation with Halsey Levine. Good Welcome, evening, Shannon. City Council. Thank you um, for making room in our agenda tonight to bring House Hill Levine forward to talk through the scope of services that was provided in your packet uh, for the meeting this evening. You'll recall, um, and maybe just for the people that are listening or viewing at home, uh, just a quick refresher, when the One Washington Place project um, did not move forward at the beginning of the year, uh, we had several council meetings and kind of strategized on where to go from here. Um, and that resulted in three items. Um, first, we uh, put together marketing signage, which went out in March um, for the key redevelopment sites that were identified, uh, including Larson Becker, West and East, the First Baptist property, formerly known as One Washington Place, and then the Boardwalk Shops property. Um, next, we um, did let or release the RFPs, um, just uh, Friday into Saturday. So um, they have been distributed to the, I think it's something like 800 um, <coughs> registrants for our bid posting um, email serv service. And also um, we've been hearing from developers um, ever since uh, Shodine withdrew their project. So we've been keeping a list and provided uh, the RFPs directly to those folks. And we're also required to publish um, that in the newspaper, so that was also done. Um, so we're at the very beginning stages of that, and there's a 90-day period for responses to allow developers to do their due diligence, to investigate the site, um, come to the city with any questions that they may have, and put together responsive proposals for our consideration. Um, and that puts our deadline for that piece of it at July 22nd. So um, we'll have some more ongoing updates as that kind of uh, transpires. But the third piece is that there um, it was a desire to look at downtown Batavia um, and create a new master plan for that sub area. So um, staff has been working with Halsey Levine and we have 
John Housiel and Nick Davis here this evening um, to walk you through the proposed scope of services for their plan. Um, just a couple of key highlights here. We're not, uh, staff's not looking for a vote or um, recommendation, informal or otherwise, this evening. Uh, we're just wanting to make sure that there's ample time for you to answer, ask and answer any questions uh, that you may have about the proposal and the scope of the project. Um, and then if uh, council's in general agreement that staff should proceed, um, we would then be working with our representatives here this evening from House Hill Levine to bring a contract forward at a to be scheduled probably in the next, I don't know what month or so, um, two to four weeks uh, time period, a contract for your consideration. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, the gentleman up. I'll stop talking so that you have plenty of time to ask your questions of them. Okay. Did you want this? Yes. That's okay. Sorry. All right. So let's see if I can. All right, so uh, first of all, thanks for having us here this evening. My name is John Houseel uh, with Houseel Levine Associates, and with me as well as Nick Davis, a principal with our firm, and Nick will be up here in just a little bit. Uh, but we're here to provide uh, a presentation, a brief presentation, about our proposal for the downtown plan for Batavia. Uh, the purpose of this is just to introduce yourselves and orient you to Houseel Levine. Some of you may not know who we are. I've had the benefit over my career so far to work with both Shannon and Scott uh, on different projects in other communities where they've worked. So uh, you guys are staffed well here, uh, nice job. Um, and look forward to this, uh, potentially working with you again on this project. So we're gonna go through a little bit about who we are, House of Levine. Um, uh, Nick is gonna walk us through uh, the preliminary scope of work that we've put forth in our proposal. And then we're gonna highlight a few different downtown plans that we've done to give you a sense of what some of the things could look like, what some of the outreach could be like, some of the engagement protocols that we would like to utilize, uh, and some of the visualization and, and development aspects of the proposal by showcasing a few other firms. <coughs> uh, so real quickly, again, my name, uh, John Housiel, and Nick, uh, principal with our firm, he'll be up here in a little bit. Uh, I'll be doing uh, um, sort of project oversight uh, and principal involvement. Nick is also a principal with our firm, and he will be the project manager uh, for this, really doing the day-to-day -day, uh, working closely with staff and you. So Houseo Levine Associates, um, I started Houseo Levine 18 years ago with Devin Levine. Uh, started out as two people in downtown Naperville. Uh, we now work all over the country. We have offices in Chicago and offices in Los Angeles, California. Uh, we work all over the United States. I think in the last 18 years, we've assisted more than 450 communities across the United States on planning projects, large and small. So from comprehensive plans where I've worked with both Shannon uh, and Scott and other communities, uh, to downtown projects, to corridors, to zoning ordinances, development visualization, 3D immersive environments, virtual reality, uh, you name it, uh, we do it. Um, and the benefit of working all over the country as well as a lot in the Midwest and the Chicago region is we can bring ideas that other parts of the country are doing that the Midwest is not. So we can say, hey, boy, we're doing this in Bentonville, Arkansas. It's pretty cool stuff. Or we're doing this just outside of Denver. It's working really well. Or we're trying some of these things in California, and communities are really finding a lot of success. So the advantage of working all over the country is we can bring different ideas to bear here locally uh, to sort of supercharge a lot of our local experience. And hopefully, as Shannon and Scott can attest, uh, we're a pretty fun group to work with. We take what we do very, very, very seriously, uh, and we put all of our effort into it. Uh, but we, we love what we do, and uh, we take a lot of pride in working with communities in a fun and engaging uh, way throughout the entire process. So I won't go into um, all the different awards, but in addition to working across the country, we have uh, several national awards. Uh, we have several state awards from the APA, Congress for New Urbanism, uh, ESRI, uh, which uh, sort of produces all the GIS platforms used across the world. Uh, and most recently, the National Award for Smart Cities for some technology work that we did and visualization work we did for a downtown town center plan in Morrisville, North Carolina. That was just last year. So this is just some of the places where we've uh, won work. This is some of our downtown planning work. I'm not going to go into all of this, obviously, uh, but we have a lot to pull from. Some small, some large, 
some historic, some contemporary, some that have come out of the ground in the last 20 years, some that have been around for more than 100 years, you name it. Uh, some that are really looking to revitalize, uh, to pick up on development opportunities that are now presenting themselves in rapidly changing markets, uh, and some that just want a facelift uh, to sort of uh, reinvigorate uh, financially and from a fiscal perspective, a downtown that may have seen better years. So every type of downtown you can imagine. And one of the distinguishing things that we sort of highlighted on this list as others have faded away, these are just some of the downtowns on waterfronts, whether they've been on the Fox River themselves or it was Geneva, St. Charles, Algonquin, uh, in Elgin, uh, whether it is on lakes and rivers up in Wisconsin like Oshkosh or on Lake Michigan like St. Joseph, Michigan, downtown master plan or New Buffalo master plan or other parts of the country. These are just some of the communities where we've done waterfront downtown master planning, which is a unique animal into itself. And a lot of the other ones have other ties uh, that would be reflective of uh, Batavia, like historic downtowns uh, or large development opportunity sites that have now presented themselves in the historic context uh, of the downtown that you have right now. So um, Nick is going to go through, that's a little bit about our firm and who we are. Nick is going to go through uh, our scope of work uh, that we put forth in our proposal fairly quickly. We can answer anything in Q&A. And then he's going to go through and highlight uh, some of the different projects uh, where we work to give you a sense of what some of our downtown's plans look like. So, Nick Davis. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for giving us an opportunity to go through this. As I'm going through the project approach and then also as I go through some of the project experience, if you have any questions, please feel free to, you know, raise your hand or just uh, start asking a question because I know there's a lot of content to go through. Um, one of the things that we had done when we initially set out to, to look at this project, we broke it down into seven different steps. So we have project initiation, community engagement, there's a planning influence in downtown profile memo, which is really just existing conditions and summarizing a lot of the community feedback up to that point. Uh, there's vision, goals, and functional land uses, downtown frameworks, the downtown plan itself, and then just finalizing that downtown plan and walking it through the adoption process. So the first step, project initiation, pretty straightforward. Uh, we would meet with city staff, we would do a downtown kickoff meeting, we would do a project tour uh, of the area, probably a driving tour and then a walking tour of specific areas. We would meet with city department heads and downtown partners. Um, we would meet with elected and appointed officials in a round table discussion, a project introduction. So very similar to this setup here. Um, just going through what the purpose of the downtown plan is, what the role of each one of these groups that we're gonna be coordinating with would be. Um, and then just a, an overview of what some of the key issues are. And that would be, there would also be an exercise as a part of that 1C. Uh, and then 1D, we would do a downtown plan advisory committee project initiation meeting. So that DPAC would serve as that sounding board, the, the group that we would consistently be coming to after we worked with city staff um, to prepare mm -hmm. some of these draft recommendations or some of the feedback that we received. Uh, again, and just using them throughout the planning process. Step two, community engagement. This is when we're gonna start to, in a couple of different ways, reach out to the, to the community, try to get feedback, both with those that are in the downtown, adjacent to the downtown, but really spread this out throughout the entire community. Uh, we would set up an interactive project website. As part of that project website, we would have map.social, which is an interactive web-based, um, or a web-based mapping tool, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about here in the next slide. Uh, and then also we would have an online downtown questionnaire. And that questionnaire can be broken out just through logic with a couple of different questions. If you're a downtown business owner, there might be some additional questions we would ask if you're a downtown resident, um, if you're just someone who lives in the community. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can ask some of the questions that we're gonna wanna ask, but geolocate that based on who's participating. We would conduct some key stakeholder interviews and focus groups. Uh, we would work and do a Main Street board uh, listening session which similar to kind of this setup uh, that we're in today, just going through, again, what the project goals are, but then just hearing what some of the challenges are, what some of the opportunities might be, uh, folding that into our process before we really start planning or, or doing any kind of recommendations or drafting. Uh, and then we would do a, a listening session with the local businesses, the downtown businesses. And again, it's just to get their feedback. I think they have a very specific challenge that they face. Um, it's kind of a day-to-day, -day, things that they would know that they could bring to the table. Uh, and things that the plan could help to address. So just as an example, this is a, a website that we have produced for a project where you know this is the landing page. As part of that landing page, uh, you can learn a little bit more about the plan, what events are coming up, uh, you know, find different documents to download, that type of thing. Uh, you'd also be able to access the map.social. So map.social is a, a web-based tool. It allows you to draw points, polygons, 
uh, and, and fields. So you're able to identify, you know, where are the community assets, where are the development priority uh, sites, where are some of the problematic intersections, or this is a poor appearance, or I'd like to get from here to here, you know, what's the best route. Uh, what's nice about this is each person can set up their own map. So again, this is an online setup. Uh, you know, you can create your own map. People are able to go in and see your maps. They can start to provide comments, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, what's great about this tool, though, is it allows us to generate, if you're familiar with uh, the Esri GIS data sets, this is all Esri data. So the second someone drops a point or draws a line, um, this gets converted into GIS information that we're able to do analysis work on. Uh, and this is stuff that we would be sharing with the city. Uh, you'd be able to use this uh, and you could access it from your ArcGIS online account. So we're able to see, you know, here's all the issues that have been identified. We can isolate them. Here are the community assets, something that's very important. We don't want to lose sight of when we do these types of projects. Um, but we're able to produce heat maps. So you get an, a, a sense of, uh, you know, where might some development opportunity sites be? Or, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of focus on this intersection. We really need to make sure that the plan addresses that. Um, and again, a lot of that is just from that community collected data that we would be using as part of map.social. Um, you're able to see some project spotlights, how many maps were created. So there's a, a social aspect to this. You can see how many comments, who's contributing, um, you know, what's the most liked comments. Uh, there's a Wordle, again, just something that's kind of pulling out what the key information is. You can click on this and go and see on uh, map.social, you know, where people are talking about parks or where people are talking about intersections. So it's just a, a community collaborative way of getting information from everybody in Batavia, uh, but also you can see what maybe your neighbor thinks. So step three is the planning influences in downtown profile memo. Uh, so this is just us preparing what would be the existing conditions memo. We would, we would present that memo to this group. We would present that memo to staff and just kind of work through, um, you know, what some of the findings are, make sure we have a good foundational understanding of what some of the challenges are, what some of the opportunities are here in downtown Batavia. Um, again, this would be uh, in memo format, but it would be including maps and, and some um, initial concepts or, or some initial findings, but no concept work. We wouldn't be preparing any recommendations. This is just us making sure that we, we understand what the channels are before we move forward. Um, as we transition into step four, we'll conduct a, a community-wide visioning workshop. Um, so this, again, can be targeted to the entire community here in Batavia. It could be um, for downtown-specific business owners, but Typically what we see is the entire community is participating. Uh, you know, we'll do these in two different stages. There'd be a presentation and a larger discussion with, with the group. And then we would break out into tables and just go through um, large format maps, you know, drawing on maps where we'd like to see connections, where we'd like to see access to the river. Um, you know, this site could be redeveloped. I wish this building looked different, that type of thing. Um, and just kind of working through that process at the visioning workshop. The vision and goals would come out of this. So the vision and the goals for the downtown plan uh, would be directly pulled from the feedback that we've gotten really throughout the first three steps and then what we learned in this visioning workshop. Uh, we would also prepare functional land use areas. And what we would do is present to uh, city staff and then ultimately to the advisory committee and, and to this group the vision and goals, um, the downtown functional land use areas, and just feedback that we would receive during the visioning workshop. And the reason that we want to make sure that we do the vision and goals and the functional land use is that's really going to drive the rest of the content and the rest of the frameworks that we'll be preparing in the next couple steps. Just as an example of the type of workshops that we've conducted, um, the community workshops would be you know, open forum. We'd start with a presentation. Uh, again, just kind of laying the groundwork for the, for the work that's been done up to this point, you know, what we're trying to accomplish with the downtown plan, feedback we've received up to that point. Uh, and then we would have, you know, this can be set up for large groups. We can break them out into tables. Um, and then we would, we would go from that larger group setting and start to get into these smaller group settings, you know, seven to eight, uh, nine, ten people sitting at a table, starting to work through on maps, you know, drawing out what the issues are or what they'd like to see in the future. Uh, one of the things that we've seen a lot of success, and I, I feel like in particular in downtown that this has um, just a, a really exciting feel to it is, you know, getting a vision board up, putting something in your downtown in an area that needs to be activated that maybe currently just isn't seeing what it could be or isn't quite performing the way you'd like it to. Uh, you know, and you could have a, an arrow pointing to like, how do I fix this site or how do I fix this building? Um, there's a lot of different examples of how you can do this, but I, I think it gets people kind of creative, especially in a more walkable space, which downtown Batavia obviously is. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to, I think, do some, some neat type of outreach, a little bit more engaging and, and kind of drawing people into the spaces. Uh, step five would be the downtown frameworks. So this is when we're going to start working on 
specific aspects of the plan. So we would be looking at, you know, the streetscape. We would be looking at transportation components. Uh, we're looking at where the public gathering space is. Um, you know, a lot of different details that would be drawn from what we talked about at that land use plan level, uh, but starting to get into to more specifics. Um, you know, how do you connect to the riverfront, that type of thing. We would do a city staff review and discussion. We would do a draft uh, downtown plan framework uh, discussion with the advisory committee. And then we would, we would do a community open house, probably a series of boards at stations to just kind of walk through each aspect of our both land use plan and the vision and goals, but also for these framework plans. Uh, step six would be the implementation framework. Uh, that's really the document that would be a summarization of everything that we've talked about uh, in the actual plan itself but it would also provide a little bit more guidance on you know, potential funding sources, where your priorities might need to be, um, who's responsible for actually implementing these, these recommendations. And a lot of times we like to condense this so they're not written as recommendations in this action matrix, but they're more they're action items. So these are things that you need to do if you achieve these or complete these actions. You know, you're realizing the vision and the goals uh, and the recommendations about the rest of the plan. Uh, we would also do a regulatory strategies framework, which I'll talk a bit, a bit more in a minute. Um, that just allows us to high level uh, start to break down, or I'm sorry, in more detail, allow us to break down what plan recommendations would impact your current zoning code. So what amendments might be necessary, um, what sections may need to be revisited, what district standards should you be addressing, that type of thing. And then we would also prepare the draft downtown plan, um, go through a staff review, meet with the steering committee, and ultimately we would come back and do a community-wide presentation and open house in step seven. So we'd go through this document uh, kind of in its totality. We could do a presentation um, maybe at the beginning of the night and then just have a series of boards to kind of walk through uh, the downtown plan. And then ultimately that would go in front of the plan commission and zoning board of appeals in a public hearing. Uh, and then in step seven C, we would have that final downtown plan to city council for adoption. Um, some optional tasks, and I'll talk about some of these in, in some of our work examples. Uh, we had talked about doing design, uh, downtown design guidelines. A lot of different ways to do design guidelines, and I think as we work through this process, if this is an optional task that um, you, know, you want to explore, they could be standalone design guidelines like what we had done in Elmhurst, and ultimately they codified portions of those in their zoning code. Um, or you could write you know, very specific design guidelines that the whole document becomes regulatory. Um, or they could just be kind of high level. You just want to make sure that you're hitting, you know, at a, at a high level the, the issues that you want to address, what the bulk standards might be or what the heights might be, um, you know, how, how window stylings might be treated or awnings, that type of thing. And then a downtown story map was another option. And that's really an, oh, an interactive web-based plan, so it's great. It's not a, a static or standalone PDF. Um, it's something that you're able to kind of scroll through it, almost like a website but it has map components built into it. So any of the maps that have been created, you can kind of zoom into a specific parcel or zoom into a specific site. So it's a little bit more engaging and you're able to get a bit more information out of it. So real quick, unless there's any questions about the scope, I was just gonna go through a few of our, our downtown plan experiences. Does anybody have any questions? On the, on the interactive one, um, on the, the story map, is that more so for developers to try to use or more so for the public to gain information about what the plan involves. So I would use it for both. And then okay. we've seen a lot of success. We recently did a story map that was um, built off of a document that we had prepared in Lincolnwood. And it was for a, a very specific site, one of their TIF districts. And they use it to just generally talk about it with the public, but they also blasted that out to all the developers that they were aware of that were interested in a site. Just, it's a really easy way to get a condensed kind of breakdown of that information, and it's a little bit more engaging. You don't have to read an entire PDF. So it's less text, more graphic intensive. Because okay. I'm just thinking of like how many people will share it on Facebook so that they can you know, not have to answer the question 17 times in a row, <laughs> what's gonna happen on that property? Exactly. Is it just in our first city not want a PDF or a final plan or print, we're scoping a front to do in a deliverable is just a story map of the final comprehensive print document. And we had to double check with the state legislation to make sure that it met and qualified the state requirements for a city to adopt the plan because the plan was all virtual, it was all online. Okay. And, and we just contracted for our first project where the deliverable is the story. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and I mean, I, obviously PDFs have a place, um, but it would be mm -hmm. great to start moving into these more web-based. I mean, you can use it on any device. It's easier to read. It's easier to move through. So there's there's a lot of advantages to doing a, a story map, and um, it's something we've seen, uh, especially in like a physical design type of document. You can see where there's there's just some benefits. 
Um, so just some, just some of our work examples. Imagine Oshkosh was a plan that we did in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, we were originally scoped to do a downtown plan for them. Uh, similar issues, they had a, a riverfront that kind of cuts through the downtown. Um, a lot of the focus was in the north side, so they were trying to draw more attention, both from developers and investors to the south side, but also just city dollars, make sure that was a focus for them. So we had identified a, a series of redevelopment opportunities, and one of them was this sawdust district. It was a massive um, sawdust area. It used to be where they made furniture, like throughout this whole district. Um, many of the buildings are dilapidated or um, in, a, in, a, in a pretty serious condition in terms of needing to be torn down. So we had prepared a series of just simple 3D massing, um, and based on some of the feedback and some of the interest that the city had seen, they were trying to attract some specific users. They wanted a major corporation, so that's what you're seeing up on the north side of this graphic, so on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, and then uh, a big arena. They were trying to attract the Wisconsin herd, which is the team that would be um, supporting to the, the uh, Milwaukee Bucks. And they ultimately, with these graphics, these visualizations, and having a plan in place, they, they won this bid. Um, they're really excited. So you know, to be able to see this come out of the ground based on their downtown plan recommendations. And again, that, that's something that ties back to our approach. We're trying to see this stuff come out of the ground. We want to see things implemented. We're not just trying to do plans for the sake of planning. Um, so this is just a good example of, of where our work is actually seeing uh, all the way th or seen all the way through an impl implementation. Downtown plan in Elmhurst, Illinois. Uh, some of the highlights here were um, very similar to I think some of the challenges that you're facing here, probably breaking your downtown into some functional land use areas, identifying uses that are appropriate, identifying the intensity of those land uses, so what the scale should be, how buildings should be located, where parking should be addressed. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, and in every community we've ever worked in, downtown parking is a real issue. Um, sometimes it, it's a perception issue, sometimes it, it is an actual problem. Um, we were told repeatedly in Elmhurst parking was a problem. They have five parking decks. I don't know if you've ever been to downtown Elmhurst. They have a seven-story parking deck. So parking isn't so much a challenge as it is a, a perception. People want to park on the street. They don't want to park in the deck. Um, so just having better signage and better coordination with these spaces, promoting the parking decks, you know, walking that park once, uh, you know, walk the entire downtown principal. And they also built this into their zoning code. So these residential parking districts ended up reducing the required parking for downtown developments. They were focused on more TOD approaches. You know, they're right off the, the metro line, so there's a lot of advantages to starting to reduce the amount of parking. So as you got closer and closer to the core, uh, you required less and less parking. We had prepared design guidelines. Um, these were very high level uh, initially, and then they had asked if we could take these to the point where each one of these design guidelines for the specific recommendations were something that they wanted to fold into zoning amendments that they made after the plan was adopted. So I, I think that's something to that be very appropriate with the options that we talked about for design guidelines uh, here in Batavia. And then a regulatory strategies framework. So this just breaks down the plan's recommendations and, and specifically identifies where you're going to need to make amendments in your code. And that's also something that we, we do provide inside of our original scope. I think this is a very helpful tool. Uh, plans are, are very important, but that next step, getting it into your, your zoning code, is, is a, a critical step to seeing this, this actually change how development occurs in the future. Um, in Bentonville, we had uh, a series of challenges. They were growing very fast. They're trying to address how housing uh, both in the downtown and around the downtown needed to be coordinated. So as part of this downtown plan that we had prepared for them, uh, we looked at things like, you know, what, what are interesting aspects to your downtown? Where should, you know, uh, infill development occur? And what would that look like in scale on, on these vacant lots? You know, whole new streets are being proposed uh, with much denser development types than they're used to. These were one-story buildings set back. These are on these new mixed-use buildings. Some of this was starting to come out of the ground before the plan was even adopted. They were moving so quickly. Um, we had prepared a downtown neighborhood uh, zoning uh, guide that just helped them in the plan identify what districts would be appropriate and how you would support the type of development that would uh, ultimately lead to the density that they needed to around their downtown. And we actually hit pause on the plan and updated their zoning code just to make sure that this was incorporated because development was occurring so quickly there. Um, they needed to make sure that they were keeping up. And then I'm not familiar with this, but we were told by the client that there's a, a show on HGTV that has used um, really just some of the, the, the amount of interest and the amount of investment that's happening in downtown Bentonville. This is a couple that specifically rehabs homes to really bring the type of housing that we identified in the plan to the Bentonville area right around the downtown, which is pretty neat, uh, not, not something we typically see, so that was exciting. Uh, and then the last plan that I just wanted to talk about was in downtown Lyle. 
Um, a, a similar approach in terms of how we had scoped this, but their challenges were unique in that they had a lot of um, you know, the bones or the history to build off of. They'd made some improvements to their streetscape, but they weren't seeing the investment, they weren't seeing the development that they wanted. Um, so as we were preparing this downtown plan, we started to identify, similar to what we would like to do here, these functional sub areas. Where's your downtown core? What types of development are appropriate there? How does your downtown fringe or your residential areas adjacent to the downtown support it, but they need to feel and look very differently um, and the uses there need to be supported in a different way. So just breaking down those functional sub areas and I think looking at your downtown in those pieces is very helpful. Um, and then identifying opportunity sites and kind of working through specifically what would be appropriate there. And I think vetting that through a policy with uh, the community is very helpful. And then that action matrix. So this is an example of what that action matrix would be. Specific actions, what goal it's achieving, time frame. You can even identify who would be responsible for it. I think that's really helpful. So with that, um, just some final remarks. We, first of all, appreciate you giving us the opportunity to present the scope. Um, I hope I was able to demonstrate we have a lot of experience doing downtown plans. Um, I also hope you've noticed that they don't all look the same. I mean, we, we really do try to approach each plan in a, in a, different, in a different way. You all have very different challenges. Um, so that kind of ties into our creativity. We get really excited about doing this kind of plan or these types of plans. Um, downtowns are very special to communities. They are the heart of the community. Um, there's a real resurgence in people trying to focus energy back into their downtowns, something that we like to be a part of. Um, you know, our commitment to all of our projects is something that drives us. I mean, we, we love doing this type of planning and I think that that really shows in our team's ability to kind of plug in and do a specific project and learn everything that we can. Um, and then implementation, it, it truly drives the type of planning that we do. We want to see, you know, this community succeed. We want to see the communities we work with. Uh, get to the goals that we've outlined and actually see stuff come out of the ground or see those changes. So with that, I thank you and any questions that you might have over here. Questions? Dan, go ahead. So I, I was uh, particularly excited to see that you had uh, uh, experience with uh, Elmhurst mm -hmm. and with Downers Grove. Those are two communities that our mayor has frequently uh, brought up um, uh, with density issues, larger buildings and whatnot. Um, my big question is, um, how, how can you help us with um, tempering density and, um, and neighborhood appropriateness? That seems to be a really big issue with these types of projects. And I see you have such experience in this. How do you help us bridge that last part? Because that's where our projects have fallen apart before. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take this first part, and then I know John wants to jump in, obviously. Um, so for Elmhurst, this was, this was very important to them, because that honestly drove the reason that they wanted to do a downtown plan first. They knew they needed to address their zoning code, but they wanted to start at a policy level, start at a planning uh, document level, get the community support, understand what maybe the, the pushback is gonna be. This downtown core, this functional sub area, um, was a very important discussion that had to happen because right next to it, you can see there's just this thin layer of a, a transitional zone, and then you're into residential districts. And, I don't know, if you've been to downtown Elmhurst, there's some height there. Um, I mean, the, the parking deck's seven stories. There's buildings that are going in that are um, now can be by right six to eight stories. They know if they could focus it in the core and start to transition it down block by block, it would blend into the residential area in a way that I think was, was supported. Um, but they couldn't just go to zoning first. That was a real issue for them. And they knew that they needed to have all of these different community workshops um, kind of show them the scale, show all these different visualizations. Uh, and I think ultimately when they took this functional sub area and codified it inside their zoning code um, with some minor tweaks, it was, it was really a much more seamless process than it would have been if they'd have gone straight to zoning, which is feedback that we've received from them. And then Downers Grove. Yeah, I was just gonna say for Downers Grove, so again, every community has to do this differently and whatever works for them. There's no magic formula for this, that's for sure. Uh, like Nick said, you know, downtowns are this symbolic heart of community, so people like living near them. People who choose to live near the downtowns want to live near the downtowns. Uh, but that proximity can be challenging. In Downers Grove, most downtowns you think of, like in Elmhurst, there's an increase in height and density as you go to the core. In Downers Grove, there's a little bit of a donut hole. I don't know if people know that or not, both in terms of height and allowed density. And the highest density is not in the actual core, but just outside the core, and then it tapers back down and through transition zoning to the established single family residential neighborhood that is on the outskirts of that transition area. So we did a downtown pattern book first, which we documented every aspect of the downtown, 
from signage to storefront to materials to history to everything. Then we did a, a downtown master plan, and then we came back after the downtown master plan when we came up with a strategy getting parcel specific, we then came back with a zoning and a regulatory strategy to deliver those densities in a way where it was respectful of the historic core, which was two to three story, the higher residential next to that that would begin to support it, and then tapering back down beyond that to the single family residential established that was surrounding it, but didn't want to be right up against it, but liked being close to it. So we'd have to work with your stakeholders, and that's why Nick said, it's not always about talking to people in the downtown, but the people all around the downtown. Um, and so through all that, we would come up with the strategies to do something that was responsive to what this community wanted for downtown Batavia, and not simply what worked elsewhere. So, you know, when we did uh, downtown Geneva years ago, um, they wanted to get pretty aggressive on some multifamily residential in their downtown. Uh, but they also had a lot of historic preservation and historic sites. Uh, and so doing both, that's a challenge. And it had to work for Geneva. Uh, uh, initially, we targeted 27 redevelopment sites. And we whittled it down to like the key eight, and we clustered them. So that even within a cluster, it wasn't one site. It was how those sites worked with each other, and then the areas that were not going to change. So we'd have to come up with a strategy working with you, staff, stakeholders, and the advisory committee to come up with a strategy that worked best for Batavia. <coughs> So there's a lot of different ways to slice that, uh, but no one right way that I could say would apply best for here. But we've done it several different ways. I'm excited to work with you, and uh, I wish we'd known about you uh, seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I just noticed when you listed all the communities that you've obviously worked with our two neighbors to the north and one to the south, in terms of North Aurora, Geneva, and St. Charles. Uh, which everybody would be quite familiar with. Um, can you give us just some examples of the implementation portion? I mean, I know that there's various things that the whole seven-step list you went through, but what are some of the things, like if we drove through those communities today, we could see that were implemented as a result of, of your work with those communities? So I know in St. Charles, um, some of the development that was happening closer to the river on the west side, and I can't think of the name of the development, there were, there were two developments that were, um, they were starting to go through the process of being developed when we wrote the downtown, or when we wrote the comprehensive plan, which is why St. Charles asked us to specifically focus on, we had originally had sub areas that were gonna be the corridors. They asked us to, to kind of pivot and focus on a downtown specific sub area um, because of those types of issues. They wanted to make sure that the way buildings were being sited and how parking was being oriented um, was more consistent with what they wanted to see in the downtown and the development proposals they were getting were, were not at that point. Um, so I know that that helped us in St. Charles, I think, get to the type of development that they want to see. I wish I could remember the development's name. Um, I remember it because my wife worked on the landscaping for the, the streetscape. Um, then in Geneva, I know a lot of the multifamily development that was occurring came out of the recommendations, kind of similar to what you're seeing here, the step down as you get closer to the river. A lot of the challenges that people were facing where they just they thought the buildings were going to be too tall um, but as you start to step down that that grade change is, is sort of in your favor um, as a resident that's at the top of the hill uh, and again I think there's a couple of examples there of, of projects that came after the downtown plan and helped kind of inform what that development should look like uh, North Aurora I'm not too sure I know that we're actually going through a process of helping them update that plan um, so I can't say specifically uh, some developments that came out of that but I mean, I, I do know that a lot of these plans, the way that we, we draft that policy guide, it's one of the first documents when development's gonna occur in their downtown that they're pointed to. You know, you need to be in compliance with our comp plan, you need to make sure that you are consistent with what we're recommending in the downtown plan. Thank you. Yep. Mark? Um, yeah, I'm excited about this. This is some good stuff. Um, I'd definitely be in favor of the story map. I think that that mm -hmm. is, again, from a development standpoint, I can see how that adds some value. Um, I also have to add, um, I'm a little freaked out because this will be like the sixth town I've lived in that you guys have done a, <laughs> a, a plan for, so. Um, following you. But uh, yeah, you guys seem to be following me. It's a little weird, but. No, it, it, it looks it looks really exciting and I'm, I'm really happy to see this. And like Dan said, I wish we'd had this a while ago. Um, and the, your, the, your methodology looks really solid and that's, that's great. Alderman Muir, what you mentioned is, um, I think it just is a demonstration of um, how prolific 
in the, the communities of Chicagoland that their work is, how highly respected they are, and how oftentimes either communities work with them over and over again, and or neighbors see what's happened as a result of the plans that they have put together and said, I want to do something like that. Yeah, but even one of the cities in Ohio that I lived in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hudson? Hudson, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> they did it downtown. Hudson, did Hudson and again, and you know this, is a lot of communities have historic downtowns, and how do you invest in new in this site? Hudson basically did what most of the communities across the country have been unsuccessful at figuring out, and that is how to have a downtown come out of nothing. So people always have a historic downtown that gets reinvented, but what if your town never had one, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you have a giant vacant site and say, like, hey, maybe we could, from scratch, build a downtown that wasn't a lifestyle center or just a store or a shopping center, but was a legit downtown. Hudson pulled it off, and it's one of the few examples in the country. So, yeah. <laughs> so we did their comp plan, their downtown plan, and the downtown phase two plan. Yeah. You've lived in some good places. <laughs> <laughs> Just a uh, quick question. I like the, like the detail, like that, Alan, you brought up before. You, we can point to something and show this is what mm -hmm. we envisioned. Right. Um, what what kind of time frame are we talking about with you? just seven steps, say? Um, I would say we're anywhere between, and this depends on how aggressive you want to be. You could do this in 12 months. That's probably what I would recommend. It could certainly be done in nine months. The challenge is um, just timing the outreach. We have a lot of outreach built into this, and you know, getting that scheduled at the right point in time. Um, I think puts us closer to 12 months, but I would say anywhere between nine to 12 months is very doable. We say we move as fast as the community is prepared to. Residents and communities don't want to feel the rush, mm -hmm. but they also don't want to say, boy, I want that workshop three months ago. Whatever happened to that project? And that's a killer. So there's a momentum. There's a synergy that has to be maintained. There's a cadence that has to be maintained. And nine to 12 months for this is perfect. It, it allows the back and forth, the end and flow. You hear something, you do some work, you circle back. People see their fingerprints on what's being developed. They want to get more involved. And there's that sort of natural cadence. So yeah, the 9 to 12 months. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here tonight. This is really exciting. Um, I'm a downtown business owner. So I hear lots of stuff about our downtown, pros, cons, um, both from the residents and patrons and other business owners. Um, and so a lot of what you presented tonight is stuff that people have talked about. Um, and so it's really exciting to see what you're presenting. Um, I'm in support of the design guidelines because um, I think that would be really good for our, to have guidelines like that as we move forward with projects and building projects. Um, a question I have, and I don't know if this is for you to answer or staff, but how does this um, plan, this downtown development plan, coincide with what we're trying to work with the park district with the depot pond in the Fox River corridor because there seems to be a lot of overlap yeah there, there's there's a little bit of overlap with some of the things um, that are going on I mean most of the park district plan is going to be more dam pond shoreline uh, you know restoration type of things um, not necessarily <coughs> land uses per se so um, there will be a little bit of overlap between the two but they're not going to be you know completely stepping on each other's toes they they're aware of the plan we've told them you know what's going on with that <coughs> so they're they're aware of uh, it as well so you know i think i think they'll they'll be sensitive to that and make sure that um, you know what goes on with that plan isn't going to you know completely conflict with what they're doing so as we move forward with, sorry, with the discussions with the park district, we don't really need to keep too much of this in mind in the next. It'll be part of it, but it's, yeah. you know, it, it'll, it'll be something that, you know, they'll be sensitive to and we'll work it into the, the various planning processes. It's not going to be like we have to wait for a decision on the dam necessarily or the decision on the pond to move forward. A lot of the things they're talking about is density and land use um, bulk of buildings and what how the area is going to be developed. and. Um, they've got some really neat tools to, to visualize things too, which we just don't have that ability right now. So we're, we're pretty excited about you know some of the things, the technology that they have to be able to portray things a little bit easier. Those of you that remember one Washington and seen the yellow brick of cheese, it's going to be a lot more uh, interesting and more uh, dynamic than, than that kind of thing. And that was one thing that I wanted to bring up too, was I think that having that study and this going kind of concurrently and fitting together and utilizing what we think is going to happen with the river in what we want to see in development, I think, is also important. And it's a great thing. I mean, I would say 80% of the time <clears> we're doing planning work, 
we're not the only planning game in town. There's other studies on whether it's transportation and active transportation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, study that might be going on, a riverfront, a parks and recreation mm -hmm. master plan, who knows what. That stuff is orbiting around all the time. And one of the things uh, that we do seamlessly, as do a lot of other firms, is see those as opportunities, not obstacles. To so say, how many times do you see a city do something say, boy, if we did just, you know, that's it done now, we'll never be able to go back and undo that. I wish we didn't know that six months ago. We wouldn't have. Well, now is our chance to make sure these things dovetail. And that's so it's the timing is actually a real benefit that you have something else going on like that where the park district does. And that's a plus. Does anybody online have any questions? Don't see any hands up. No hands. Well, I thank you guys for yes. coming in and showing us everything here. I think the majority of us, or at least everybody in this room, I think is excited about this because I think this is something that we've talked about. You know, we had an old plan. We updated it a little bit a while ago, but it really wasn't, I guess, in, in touch with today's technology. So I think that's the other thing that I think is really important is being able to get all that information into one place and utilize all of it. And again, I think it's really important when we have other things going on that they do fit together, that they do take advantage of what each one of those entities in town is trying to look for or what each one of those opportunities are in the different locations that they are so that way we can make this all work. And, you know, I, I really feel like that's the key here is not to do anything in a vacuum anymore, is to try to do it all together. And really, you know, we talk about it when we talk about the river study, that we want to be comprehensive from border to border. And I think that that's really where I think we have to think about downtown is. Is it just the downtown that everybody knows and is familiar with from the last 50 years? Or is it three more blocks on this side and two more blocks on that side that we want to be included in our downtown. So I think this is a really good juncture to look at all that and really try to make the right decisions to move it forward. And again, this is something we can do and then come back and revisit in five years. As things progress, hopefully run out of space to do it in and then not have to worry about that anymore. So that's, that's kind of my take on where I think we should go with this. So I'm excited about it. I think it's a really good thing. Well, again, we appreciate the opportunity. We think this could be a really fun project mm -hmm. for the city to really go up its sleeves and get into. And the most important thing about planning is we've got some scale, especially with other towns. It's the city's burden to articulate a vision, mm -hmm. to really say this is what we want, yeah. to demonstrate market viability for that vision, and then put the tools in place to say this is how we're going to make the pieces place and get this thing. <clears> so this is your chance, I think, to really just knock it out of the park and be We'd be loved, uh, love to work with you on the project. We think it'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think we, we all thought that when we started into our streetscape plans and we started to do everything and then we got all that going and things were filling in and then got slammed by COVID. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, we got to get that momentum back and we got to make this happen. Right. So I think this is our next logical step. Mm -hmm. Scott? Yeah, I think uh, Shannon and I both are very excited to you know work with uh, John and his crew and John and Nick and their crew. and. Uh, to try and do this. Um, this is something that's you know, been, we've talked about it, we've punted it around. Uh, we really respect their work uh, that they've done in different communities and our work with them formally. So um, we're very happy that we were able to find an opportunity for them to, to do some work and I think they'll do a great job of, of this. Um, just so you know, for budgeting purposes, um, we have 128,000 in the program is what they're proposing. We have 120,000 budgeted this year. Um, we can make up that uh, either by um, additional TIF revenues that you know we can use for that, or if it rolls over into the next year fiscal, depending on our time frame, we can use it in the next year's budget, as well as the optional uh, uh, task. If we decide we're going to do those, we can do that for the uh, next year's budget too, if that works out timing-wise. Okay. Well, I think we're pretty much agreed to move forward. I think we just have to figure out exactly how much we want to do and where we're going to get the money to pay for it. Right. So our next step, we'll, we'll put together a contract with them and okay. present that to you, and then we'll, we'll uh, move forward. Okay. Look forward to that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Much. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay. Now we'll move on to item number 10. <clears throat> and because we don't have a chairman or a vice chair for that, I'll take that tonight. Um, it will be uh, resolution 
2253R, uh, approving a not to exceed 69,627 cost uh, proposal provided by ComEd for the SCADA circuit upgrade to replace the AT&T phone line that read meter readings at Northeast and Southeast substations. And we're still trying to get this done. <laughs> well said. Fact, staff is bringing forward a recommendation tonight that we're not entirely happy with, um, but we, we kind of find ourselves in a position of um, you know, recommending it because we need to move this towards a, a, a conclusion. Uh, the saga really began back in 2006 when we interconnected with ComEd at the 138 level. Starting back then, we were required to have a data connection to the ComEd meters so that ComEd knows how much energy we're using. Uh, for many years, that data connection existed across AT&T phone lines, uh, relatively low in cost. But as you see in the memo that Rahat prepared, around 2016, costs started to ex escalate. And that's due to the fact that it's old technology, and AT&T wants us off that technology, so they keep increasing the price. It was over three years ago now that we began formal discussions, although informal discussions had been going on even prior to that with ways to get this data to ComEd other than the AT&T phone line. We explored using our own fiber to bring it over to the Aurora Energy Center. We explored interfacing with PJM and, and having data flow through PJM. We explored cellular options. Uh, we explored other, another fiber route up north through, actually into West Chicago, um, all of which ComEd dismissed and, and, and really did not want to pursue um, it has taken considerable arm twisting to even get, a, get us to this point, but we are now doing a fiber solution, a little different fiber solution that, that ComEd is going to take over and be in charge of, and they're more comfortable with that. Uh, that does require equipment upgrades at both our substations as well as at our public works facility. Um, as I indicated in the, in the second, well, Rahad indicated, and he and I kind of worked together, in the second paragraph here on the second page, we're not pleased with the magnitude of the cost estimate. If you recall, at the end of the year, right prior to the holidays, staff was here because ComEd had given us an uh, initial $30,000 proposal, and we came to you um, unofficially to, to, to get authorization to sign that proposal with the promise that we'd be back, um, you know, more of a formal meeting like this to finalize everything out. Um, as that progress has gone on now these last couple of months, and we are now just given this additional roughly $39,000 proposal, you know, we hit the timeout button and said, we have got to come to our city council uh, because this is, you know, this is excessive. I've said that now several times, but the flip side of it is, so people are saying, why are we doing this? We're doing this primarily because right now we're faced with a $16,500 per month phone bill. So every month, we're spending $16,500 on these AT&T lines. That's why, you know, staff's recommending for us to kind of plug our nose and spend $69,000 uh, with ComEd to have a permanent solution that will be done with. We will no longer have the monthly bill from AT&T, and within about five months, uh, we'll, we'll recover our costs on that. Um, that's my summary. Again, I, I, we are recommending 22-053, and I, one final word. Um, we've made ComEd clear of our displeasure with the cost. We've made ComEd clear that every um, expenditure needs to be detailed to us uh, when this project closes out. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've told them we're trying to hold them accountable for all their expenses as best we can. So staff's recommending that we go ahead and approve this resolution. Just one question. So there will be no more monthly fees of, of any kind? Correct. Yeah. yeah, I guess the thing that the thing that got me is I went back and read this again because I've known about this going on for the last yeah. several years, is it's like, okay, if we sell electricity to anybody, we provide the meter and we tell them how much they took and then we bill them for that. I don't understand why ComEd can't do the same thing. I, I, that That whole part of that escapes me as why that's not the way this is set up because we've always been the one that's required to have the metering equipment and the connections to get that information out correct they're actually technically comeds meters 
But Comet has no way of communicating with those meters because those meters are in our substations. They're not in a Comet substation. Mm -hmm. So that's the communication. Right. So technically, they have meters in our substations, but they don't have a way to communicate with them. Mark? Um, I agree that the price seems absurd. Um, do they have the, so you said there's some equipment that needs to be replaced. Do they have equipment on hand? So thank you for a good question because I just got that email <laughs> earlier this evening. Um, they anticipate this project to be finished by early July, and they have made the sentence that they're, they're going to be having equipment that they have to acquire. So I know where you're going with that. I, I wonder about the timelines on that. Yeah, because that's, that's a real struggle. Right um, we deal with it a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're yeah. buying a lot more equipment. But that's, that's my fear, and I don't know if there's any way to hold them accountable to a date and get a reduction in price if we continue to pay $16,000 a month. It's, we're not getting, I mean, it's still a short ROI, but it's still, like I said, it's an absurd cost. Okay. And we can't have somebody else run the fiber or anything? I'm sorry? We can't have somebody else run the fiber and do all that We've stuff? We've tried twice. We've tried to two different routes, into Aurora and up to West Chicago, and, and they will not run on our fiber. I agree. So that, they, they want their own fiber? That's what they're doing. Is the reality, and they wouldn't let us? install it or get to wherever their communication point is. We tried to get, the Aurora Energy Center sits on Eola Road, south of Butterfield down mm -hmm. there, it's the old uh, turbine plant. That's a, ComEd's got a node there, and they've also got a node just on the border over in West Chicago. We tried to get to both of those nodes on our fiber, and that was not acceptable to them. Yeah, I was just going to comment. I think it's absurd that what they're charging, but I think it was more absurd than sixteen thousand dollars a month when it was yeah. you know, ten years ago. It was a thousand. Well, that, and wasn't that also the thing when we That's went to lines. upgrade the um, the lines into the one Washington property that AT and AT and T's price was just absurd to get in to do that when that was upgraded. We yeah, didn't I remember that specifically. That that was it seemed to me that I recall that that was extremely expensive compared to what it used to be. Yeah, I'm not a phone person, but my understanding is that as AT&T tries to, out, to phase out these old technologies, mm -hmm. they just keep raising the price to get people off the line. To get people to stop with it. Yeah. I think that happened with uh, Tricom, with the setup that they had, yeah. switching everything over to fiber from the older copper. Yeah, setup. I'm not allowed to say how much money we save by getting rid of all of our telephone lines across the country. <laughs> A lot. Yeah. It, it, I'm sure it is. And, you know, I guess, yeah, it's one of those where you just kind of quietly set the check down over there and walk away. Well, I will assure you, though, to Alderman Ewer's point, we are trying to stay on top of them mm -hmm. with regards to accountability as best we can. Yeah. And, and I guess that would be my only thing that Mark brought up. You know, if all of a sudden, you know, what I deal with on a daily basis is I end up paying. 30 or 40 percent of the cost of a part now to ship some stuff because there's no way to get it cross country in a normal chain that was there before. Right. So, you know, make sure that whatever we can do to stay on them to get it done when they said they were going to get it done. So, our liaison person at, at ComEd has been great. He's wonderful okay. to work with. It's beyond his mm -hmm. scope, unfortunately. To, to, he doesn't oh, yeah. control all the other people in the, in the right. game. So. Or, or the product availability. I mean, yeah. so. communications. So, so mm -hmm. getting communications will not, I don't have any issue with that. There won't be an issue because our, our local person will communicate. Mm -hmm. It's whether his ability to, to drive action, that's what mm -hmm. it's limited to. Anybody else have any comments? Can we get the other people back up on the screen so we can see who's here? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Do you know how to do that click the box up on the right. Click on the box up on the top right. And the, yeah. I got it. Bingo. Thank you. That way, if hands get raised, I can at least see them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else with any comments? Anybody else want to air their frustration? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will make the motion that we recommend to council resolution 20, uh, 2253R, approving a not to exceed $69,627 cost proposal provided by ComEd.
for the SCADA circuit upgrade to replace the AT&T phone line that read meter readings at both the northeast and southeast substations. Second. Motion by Wolf, second by Ewer. Roll call, please. Wolf? Aye. Barron? Aye. Lehman? Aye. Ayasi? Aye. Malay? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Throne? Vogelsinger? Aye. Miller? Rosado? Beck? Aye. Connolly? Aye. Chanson? Aye. And Sulpa? Aye. Motion carried 11 to 0. Okay, that went through unanimously, so I think we should put that on consent agenda so we don't have to talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, up next is item 11, resolution 2252R, authorizing execution of a one-year contract with Klaus Brothers Incorporated for a 22, or 2022 code enforcement uh, abatement for lawn mowing. Jeff is here. And Jeff is that the city service? Yeah. Yeah. So I that, that Tony? Way. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is um, a, a bid was put out March 1st uh, for mowing uh, abandoned or non-maintained properties. Uh, there were no bids returned. Um, no. Interesting. Uh, until the staff went out to seek more bids. I'm confusing uh, it with the other one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I did too at first when I first read this. Uh, there were no bids received uh, by the closing on March 18th. Uh, staff went out and was able to solicit one bid, um, and that is with Claus Brothers um, Incorporated. Um, this, uh, I don't see anything budgeted in here as uh, the uh, liens get placed on these properties um, that are not, uh, or that are being taken care of. Um, so I guess the question I have is what, what kind of expenses is that? I don't know if. Uh, Jeff is online. Yeah, there he is. I can see behind me. Yeah, good evening. Um, we we don't have a lot of these properties that we continually maintain. Um, there's probably, I would say, maybe half a dozen usually every year that that we end up having to maintain um, with this pro with this program. Um, you know, I think typically we're we're in the you know ten thousand dollar range probably um, with this, uh, depending on how many times we have to mow it. Um, the, the more properties, the more mowing, the, the more it is. Um, this is something that is is in our budget for under contractual services, but it is, as you mentioned, it is reimbursed um, when we file liens on the property and when the property is sold, um, we should hopefully get most of this, if not all of it back. Um, and, the, and these are properties that we, we don't maintain uh, to look like your lawn uh, at your house. I mean, th these are ones that we cut if necessary, probably every three to four weeks, um, just to keep them uh, down below our eight inch requirement for, for uh, weeds. Um, so there, it's not one that we cut um, every week. All right, thanks. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, no bids came in originally. Uh, who who's, uh, did it in the past, in previous years? Were they not in? Uh, we anymore? actually, our, our contractor who had done it in the past, which was uh, Green Thumb Brown Boots, um, declined to renew the second year of a renewable contract. Um, she informed us that um, they would not be interested in renewing it. Um, you know, I think probably because of increased workload and also increased costs with everything going on. So she did notify us that she would not be uh, continuing with the second year of the contract. Um, it was, you know, either either option to renew. So um, that's when we did go back out to bid for this and did not receive any bids. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, anyone have any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, I'd recommend we send to council with a positive recommendation, resolution 22052R, authorize an execution of a one-year contract with Claus Brothers Incorporated for 2022 code enforcement abatement of lawn mowing. Second. Okay, motion by Malay, second by your roll call, please. Malay? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Sarum? Vogelsinger? Aye. Miller? Rosado? 
Beck? Aye. Connolly? Aye. Chanson? Aye. Sofa? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Lehman? Aye. And Ayazi? Aye. Motion carried 11 to 0. Okay, consent. consent agenda as well. Okay. All right, we'll move on then to item number 12. Oh, uh, oh no, it's, we're waiving the. We have to waive bids. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm not sure it can go on consent because we have to yeah, waive right, formal bidding, right. so right. I think it may have to go on the regular agenda. Regular agenda. agenda. Yep. Thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to item 12, which is project status. Laura? Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of things. Um, Colonies put out the bike share bikes this year in the racks on the South Plaza and by the Depot Museum. And we also uh, were offered five additional bikes without an increase in cost at a third rack. And so that third rack will be installed on uh, North River Street on the east side of the pedestrian bridge. And that um, is likely to go in this week or next week. I'd like to thank everyone who provided letters of support in, uh, for our application for funding through Lauren Underwood's Office for Relocation of the Batavia Interfaith Food Pantry and Clothes Closet. We actually received 116 uh, letters of support, which is outstanding. So we are uh, very, very hopeful and, and that we will be the recipients of that grant and will receive funding to assist with the relocation of the, uh, the food pantry. As many know, we've been working in conjunction with them for a few years now, trying to find an appropriate location and that funding will really help. In Public Works, we've received notice that Batavia was named one of 57 recipients for the Safe Routes to School funding. We received the maximum allowable funding of $250,000. The match is a federal participation for the SRTS funding cycle in 2021 uh, will be, oh, SRTS funding cycle 2021, which will be 80% requiring a 20% local match. Um, the safe routes to school funding um, allows us to uh, increase the number of sidewalks in our community specifically um, to assist with uh, walking and, and kids biking to school. And the locations um, that were identified in this uh, grant were J.B. Nelson, H.C. Storm, and Gustafson School. The, in, um, we do want to let everyone or remind everyone know that we are going to cancel the Committee of the Whole meeting for May 3rd because of the conflict with the uh, Brotherhood Banquet. And the Plan Commission is also canceled for May 4th. They will have items on their agenda on the May 18th um, to be determined at this point. Also, um, we received the building permit application and plans for the proposed Culver's restaurant on Randall Road, and this is under uh, staff review, and Pulte is scheduled to close on the Landmire Farm Winding Creek property um, on May 2nd. And after closing, all the related development uh, documents will be recorded, including the formal annexation of the property and the plan to start mass grading as soon as possible. Uh, they want to take advantage of the current construction season. So it'll be exciting to see that new subdivision get underway. And um, over the past several weeks, members of the Batavia Police Department Investigations Unit have been conducting semi-annual liquor and tobacco sales compliance checks. These uh, checks have now been completed with an overall retail compliance rate of over 90%. And that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions for me. Does anybody have any questions for Laura tonight? Anybody online? Okay. And then do we have any others for this evening? Anybody with any others? Okay, if not, I will need a motion to go into executive session for potential litigation. And we will have action after that. So moved. Second. Motion by Salfa, second by your roll call. Salfa? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Lehman? Aye. Ayazi? Aye. Malay? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Sarah? 
Vogelsinger? Aye. Miller? Rosado? Beck? Aye. Connolly? Aye. And Chance it? Aye. Motion carried 11 to 0. And just to let folks know who are uh, in the attendee panel that I will uh, text you when the executive session is ending so that you'll know when to look for information about how to log back into the uh, public session. And I will, and for uh, our members online attending the executive session, please look in your email for uh, an email that you received from Howard Chasen at the beginning of this meeting for information about how to log into um, the executive session. Oh, we don't have to wait. We are unmuted now? Okay. Thanks. I won't pull a president. <laughs> Live mic moment. <laughs> Not that I'm worried about it, but. Okay, Tom Connolly okay. has arrived. We're still waiting for our attendee. Yep. And we can wait for that. Uh, Actually, we'll go ahead and do a roll call now to go back into regular session. Recording in progress. Miller? Rosado? Back? Here. Connolly? Here. Chanson? Here. Sofa? Here. Wolf? Here. Baron? Here. Lehman? Here. Ayasi? Here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Here. Saron? And Vogel Singer. Here. We have 11 out of 14. All right. Thank you. And okay. And Mr. Cerny is also here. Okay. We'll move on to item 15, which is an action item on the 2021 West Side Property Maintenance Contract Renewal with Shamrock Hardscapes and Restorations Incorporated. And per discussion in executive session, I will be uh, recommending that we direct the city attorney to pursue all available remedies under the contract as uh, entered into with Shamrock Hardscapes and Restoration. Second. Baron. Okay. Motion by Wolf, second by Baron. Roll call, please. Oh, do we have any discussion? Does anybody want to make any comments? Mr. Cerny? Did you want to make any comment, Mr. Cerny? I, I would simply state that, uh, you know, I would request a mutual termination of the agreement, but it sounds like you guys in session decided to pursue litigation. So uh, I'll save my comments for another day if that's the case. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, then uh, roll call, please. Wolf? Aye. Baron? Aye. Lehman? Aye. Ayazi? Aye. Malay? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Theron? Vogelsinger? Aye. Miller? Rosado? Beck? Aye. Connolly? <laughs> Connolly? Aye. Chancet? Aye. And Sulfa? Aye. Motion carried 11 to 0. All right, thank you. All right, up next is item 16, which is resolution 22-51-R, authorizing execution of a one-year contract with Acres Group for the 2022 Westside Property Maintenance. 
Gary? The city did advertise and we did receive two public uh, bids for uh, west side property maintenance. Um, due to other circumstances, as we've described earlier this evening, um, we, we were forced to bid this project out very late in the season um, with the bid opening occurring only a few days ago. Um, we did receive a bid from Acres Group. Their bid was in the amount of $134,988, which represents a 214% increase over last year's contract amount. Uh, that will result in the need for us to do a budget amendment, and we will do that at the end of the season. Um, we are recommending approval of a one-year contract, and we will plan to rebid the West Side uh, project next winter, uh, well in advance of the season, uh, most likely with a multi-year uh, renewable contract once again. So we are recommending approval of Resolution 22-051 in the amount of $134,988 to Acres Group. Anybody have any comments on this? You know, this is kind of one where we're stuck in this position, especially this late in the season. I, I have just one question, Gary, on the, on the bids. Did that was it just a single line item on on that, or was it for each of the individual parcels? Um, I don't remember if I saw that. You know, I I and I didn't print off the whole bid packet, unfortunately. But my memory serves that we know. Parcel by parcel, so how much it costs. Cost. My memory serves as. I, I just, you know, just am curious to see if was it just that total increase spread across all of the properties, or is it fuel costs, or what was the the, the crazy difference between the two? I mean, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I'm just trying to understand it some more. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it has to do with we are already in April. Right. Landscape companies already have their work lined up for the year. Mm -hmm. Um, there are those other issues, labor and um, fuel, commodities costs. I think it all added up. And equipment. I mean, I think, you know, if I'm running the business and I've got to go out and either pay somebody overtime or hire more employees, buy more equipment, it's going to be more. I, I didn't think it would be that much more, but right. <laughs> I guess it is. You can hope for is a really dry year. <laughs> I don't think that okay. changes. Unfortunately, it's not in each. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> okay. I'll make the motion that we recommend to Council Resolution 22-51-R, ex authorizing execution of a one-year contract with Acres Group for the 22, uh, 2022 West Side property maintenance. Second. Motion by Wolf, second by Ewer. Roll call, please. Wolf? Aye. Barron? Aye. Lehman? Aye. Ayazi? Aye. Malay? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Surround? Vogelsinger? Aye. Miller? Rosado? Beck? Aye. Connolly? Aye. Chancet? Aye. And Sulfa? Aye. Motion carried 11 to 0. Okay. We are done with that. And the only thing I have is a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Motion by Ewer, second by Malay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Good night, everybody.